Well, good morning, Portico Church. It's good to see you all this morning. Welcome to, we have this morning, Future Gen Sunday. You'll see uh, some students kind of serving around here um, and also here on stage as well. And um, so it's just a joyful morning to be with you all this morning. My name is John. I'm the director of worship here. I want to invite you all to stand as we begin worship this morning. Sorry. 
that chorus one more time. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity for us to come together and worship uh, together. I just pray that uh, as Desmond preaches today, that it wouldn't be his words, but it would be yours. Um, and thank you for getting us here, even though there's snow and uh, it's a big day. But uh, just just remind us that we need to be thankful that we're here and we get together together. Uh, there are places where we can't do that. They can't do that. Um, so thank you for this opportunity for us to come together and please calm our hearts and uh, just take away any fears or sadness or things that we're going through and just help us to submit our hearts to you uh, and just please speak to us today. Amen. Good singing with you, church. Please be seated. morning. How are you guys doing today? How's your weekend going? Great. You got here in the snow. Well, hey, my name's Jason, and I'm going to welcome you if you're new, and that's kind of funny because I'm brand new here, too. <laughs> so welcome to Portico Church, but I, I know April. Do you guys know April? Yeah. So love April, love Chris. Uh, we, got to, we were in the same community group way back when. Do you remember that? The Dickerson group. Yeah, yeah. Bo Dickerson group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is a big story there, huh? Yeah. So we want to take a moment and just welcome you to Portico Church if you're new. Um, if, if this is your first time, uh, don't feel awkward. Uh, we would love for you to get connected to the life of the church. And there's just a few things that we would uh, tell you right now to get you going. Uh, first, this is Future Generation Sunday. And this Sunday, we have our team built just by kids, just by young adults, and they are running the entire church today. So we can give them a hand. Yeah. And I think they're rocking it today. Don't you think they're rocking it? They're pretty good. They are rocking it, and they all have a shirt on like April. So if you see them up here on the platform in worship or in hospitality, um, give them a thumbs up. Uh, this, guess what? They're going to go somewhere where you're not going to go probably, which is the future. Right, And so we want to welcome them, we want to encourage them, and as a church, as our mission, creating churches for future generations. Did mm -hmm. I get that right? Yep, yeah, you got that right. All right, so um, we are all about making sure that the gospel doesn't stop with us, but we are pouring into the next generation and equipping them. So we're so thankful for that. In fact, I came to Christ in a youth group. I, was not, I did not grow up in a Christian home. Um, I came to Christ in a church across the street. Uh, they used my wife as bait to get me there, but um, they shared the gospel with me, and it changed my life, and uh, so it's, it's very, very important that we continue to do that. A few other things uh, that I would mention, I'm new here, so give me some grace. Uh, you can text in church even now to get some information. First of all, if you're a guest, I think there's a number right up there. If you're new, you can text GUEST to 434-771-1700. Uh, and we will connect you. You can also text a group there if you're interested in getting involved in a community group. They are the lifeblood of this church, small groups that meet during the week. Grace, if you have a need, we would love to help you with that need. Uh, get, if you want to get connected, you're just like, yeah, I'm new here. What am I supposed to do next? Text that. And also give. If you're looking for ways to give and serve, text give to that number, and we will connect you as well. April. Yes. First of all, I'm going to ask you to do something, which I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. I'm going to ask you to tell us about Connect, because you do serve and Connect, mm -hmm. yes. Yep. But one of the things I love about April is she can speak in this amazing Long Island accent. Can oh, you yeah. do that? Every time I see Jason, they ask me to say it. <laughs> <laughs> we used to be in community group. How long ago was it? It was uh, 2009? 2000? Yeah, yeah, at least. A long at time least, ago. Yeah. I know. You can take the girl out of New York, but you can't take the New York out of the girl. That's right. That's yeah. what I hear. <laughs> 
All right, so I always say this one phrase. I saw Paul walking down the street, talking to his dog, just about to get in the car, and I said, I'll call you later. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I do want to um, put a plug in. I can't get enough of that. I'm sorry. I'm here all day. Um, uh... I, I would love to put a plug in for Connect. I, um, Daniel asked me to say something. I was like, oh, okay, I guess I could say something. But um, I've been serving with Connect for two years. Connect is one of the best parts of my week. I always end up leaving my three-year-old with Chris, and he has to watch her during Connect. And I'm like, Chris, I cannot give up this time. It's, it's such a blessing to me to serve with the youth. And I, truthfully, I started because I didn't understand teenagers. You know, I have Morris, who's a teenager, and I was like, I don't, know how to, I don't understand them. I gotta connect with them. So I joined Connect as a mom. So yes, you can join as a mom or a dad. Um, and I think I'm pretty cool. They don't, I mean, my kids. He's thanks. very cool. My, my kids don't think I'm cool, but, you know, maybe the other kids do. We'll see. But, um, yeah, it's a big blessing. So if you would love to serve with Connect, um, you can definitely uh, touch base in, at the welcome desk. Uh, you can reach Daniel, talk to Daniel about it. Uh, if you are a youth, middle school and high school, and you're not part of Connect, you're missing out. I think last week we did the game Body Body, which I don't think everyone knows what that is, but the whole church goes dark, and it's pretty much like the game Mafia. So there's it's probably a lot too of fun. much information, April. Too much information. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, anyway, lots of fun. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. And we were going to have some baptisms this morning of, of some kids from Connect, mm -hmm. but Pastor Daniel is not feeling well, so lift him up, and he's going to do that on another Sunday. So we will reschedule that. So we'll have Future Generation Sunday too, so they can be baptized. So if you were prepared for that, that's why we're not having baptism today. Yeah. I know he's bummed to miss out. Yeah, seriously. We also have Pacham coming up. Pacham's coming up. Yeah, so Pacham, if you have not already served at Pacham, is one of the biggest blessings for our community. And it starts on March 26th. No, February 26th. February 26th. To March 26th. Right. A whole month. A whole yeah. month. The great news is we don't have to cook. All the other churches in town are doing the cooking. So there are many positions that we need filled um, with volunteers. We need about 50 volunteers. And if you just have one evening that you can come, sit, hang out, welcome the men that, as they come in, um, play games with them, talk with them, it is, it is honestly just a really a heartfelt time, mm -hmm. you know. And we bring our, we bring my, I bring my, Chris and I bring our kids, and um, it really says a lot that we can come together as a church and do this. So please go to the welcome desk, or you can sign up. I think there's um, the sign up right there. And it, it has all the different dates of what we need. So we need you. Yeah, I think you can even, if you look at, the, at your bulletin, there's a QR code on the very front. You can sign up with that QR code. I, I served in Pacham over a decade ago. And let me just say this. If you're having trouble connecting with the Lord or you're feeling distant, many times it's because you're not serving. Like, mm -hmm. Take a moment and serve somebody else as you connect with the Lord, and it really is a great way to... Um, just get them a new faith mm -hmm. and jump in there. Yeah. And sometimes you see the guys around town, and then you get to make, make friends with them. So. This, is, this, is our, this is our town. This is our neighbors, right? Mm -hmm. So let's get in on that. Uh, there's one more thing, I think. It's giving. Yep. Right. So we already talked mm -hmm. to you about how to text to give. You can do that. Uh, you can also go on our website and give as well. If you brought a gift that you want to give today, we have boxes at the both exits. You can do that. And just like serving Pacham is an act of worship, when you're giving financially or giving of yourself, giving of your time, your talent, your gifts, what you're saying is that God is my Lord, right? I worship him. And so anything that you have that you give to him, he will magnify that. So even our financial gifts. So this, this is a way that we can worship him together as a family. Mm -hmm. Amen. Did we forget anything, April? I don't think so. I think you have to pray. That's right. <laughs> Would you pray with us, please? Heavenly Father, we come before you. Uh, we belong to you. Let us not forget that. Through what you have done in the person, the work, the resurrection, and the expected return of Christ, all this we hold on to and we belong to you. We thank you for our future generations. Every single one of us grew up, Lord. Let us remember. Let us pour in. Let us serve as spiritual parents. Let us serve parents who are raising children and kids. 
Let us love and serve this future generation. And we pray that you would magnify their gifts even today as they serve us. We love them so much. Bless our gifts and receive them, Lord. And we do pray uh, as the word of God is opened up today that you would open up our hearts and our minds that we might receive from you and never be the same. So we commit this to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Kenna, I am a ninth grader and I'm on the student leadership team with Connect and I'm going to read the passage for today's preaching. It is 1 John 2, 28 through 3, 3. And now little children abide in him so that when he appears we may not have confidence and not shrink from him in shame <laughs> If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be not has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. This is the word of God. Amen. Give it a hand. Give it a hand. Hey. Thank you so much, McKenna. Appreciate that. Um, it's future generations. You love that. Uh, reading the word, we in John, First John, where he's dealing with future generations as well as he talked to um, some younger saints and encouraging them uh, to remain firm in the faith. Uh, my name is Desmond Glenn, there you go, the name is on the screen. I uh, pastor of Mission and Mercy here at Portico Church. It's a joy to be with you this morning. Everybody doing okay? We here? We good, I hope y'all up, man, because I got a couple, at least a double shot this morning. Get going, right? Um, let me do this, let me pray, and then we're gonna jump right in. Um, I want to get out the way. I want to allow the future generations. I want the word of God to be heard, but I would love, I love to see um, our future generation uh, standing and uh, proclaiming and singing God's word from the stage as well. So uh, let me just uh, read, uh, let me pray for us, and then we'll jump right into it. So Father, thank you so much uh, for your word. Um, thank you for um, uniting us as a church. Um, thank you for reminding us, encouraging us to be confident before Christ at his coming. Thank you for giving us the instructions we need in this life. Lord, may you be glorified. May Satan be horrified and the church be edified. And may you remove me, Father, and Holy Spirit show up and show out in our lives. We ask this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, last week, Pastor uh, E dealt with deconstructing Jesus. Uh, he, he addressed some of the major issues that were going on and that goes on nowadays why people leave the faith. Um, and when people leave the faith, that causes a ripple effect locally within the church and globally within the church. And here this morning, we find John also encouraging believers who have been experiencing some doubt, experiencing some discouragement because some family members, some friends, some church members have not only walked away from the local church, but they have walked away from the faith as well. But John also encourages us this morning. He encourages us to live in light of Christ's return, live in light of Christ's return. And he used Christ's return as a motivator to motivate us to holy living. 
for my note takers out there, what, let me give you the main point John is getting across for us. He's saying as believers, we can be confident before Christ because we have fellowship with, with God and our children of God. As believers, we can be confident before Christ because we have fellowship with God and we are children of God. John encourages us to have, be confident and he reminds us there's two movements in the text. He says the reason we can be confident is because, number one, he gives us that he tells us how we should live. That's the first movement in the text. He reminds us how we should live. Secondly, he reminds us who we are. How should we live? He said abide, abide in him. Practice, apply. So it's abide and apply. Abide in Christ. Apply his principles to our lives. But then he tells us who we are. Who are we? We're children of God. The text tells us we're children of God. Let's just jump right in. The first verse says, and now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Uh, that word, when he appears here, John may be also correcting some of the false teaching that was going on. There was the idea that Jesus really wasn't physically real, and John debunks that thought and just says that, no, 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 he is. In chapter 1, if you remember, John says what? That I've seen him. I've touched him. I've heard him. The same person that I've spent time with, this person is publicly coming back, visibly coming back. So I know that's not true. So John encourages them. No, I know this person. He is a real individual that's coming back. But up to this point, I want you to look at something else in the text. Notice this word abide. Abide. By now, the word has been used at least four times in John, in 1 John. In, in uh, verse 24, he tells, what, he tells us what? That the word abides in us. In verse 27, he says what? The anointing abides in you, which is the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 28 that we get to this morning, he says what? You abide in him. What I'm trying to get you to understand is that John's saying, you need to understand the assignment this morning. John is saying, abide in Christ, that we have a responsibility to abide. God has put his spirit in you. He's given you his word. But then there's a responsibility on our part to abide with him. Are you following me here? Am I talking to myself? We good. We good this morning. All right. That we are to abide in him. So as we dive in, we're focusing on how should we live, abide in him. I remember growing up, there was this song, this hymn that uh, the older saints, the seasoned saints in the church used to sing all the time, in the garden. I don't know. Some of y'all might know that hymn, in the garden. The, psalm, the hymn writer says, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God disclosing. And the chorus go, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me that I'm his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none has ever known. What the hymn writer is trying to get us to understand and paint a picture, he's trying to show you what it looks like to abide with Jesus. What does it look like for you to abide with Jesus from day to day in your life? There's community groups that help you abide with him. Abiding with him is talking with him, walking with him, listening to him. I love the hymn writer. He just said, I came to the garden, but God did the talking. <laughs> you missed that. I showed up in the garden early. But it was Jesus doing the talking. That's a humble heart. That's abiding. You got the peoples and community groups you can abide with. What does your abiding look like when it comes down to spending time in God's word? John commands us in the text to abide. Abide 
with him. John carries on. He says this. He informs us that this this abiding in Jesus has a purpose. What is this purpose? Let's look at the text. It says, abide in him so that. Say so that. So that when he appears, we may have what? Confidence. Confidence. Not to do what? Shrink away at his coming. It's to build that confidence. What is this confidence that he's talking about? John is not dealing with self-confidence. He's talking about a God confidence. A God confidence. This is what this is this this confidence that he's talking about is a confidence that depends on the grace of Jesus, the mercy of Jesus, the power of Jesus, the strength of Jesus, the atonement of Jesus. He's not talking about his own self-confidence and the self-confidence we should have. He's saying this confidence is depending on what Jesus has done on my behalf. Paul displays this type of confidence in Philippians chapter 4. You remember, it's the popular verse. He says, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through who? Christ, who strengthened me. That was Paul saying, I can endure any circumstance that life throws at me. Why? Because my confidence is not in myself. It's in Jesus. That's my confidence. And what John is telling us this morning is that I need for you to have that same type of of confidence right now. So when Jesus showed up, you're confident because you've been what? Abiding in him. You've been abiding in him. I love the fact that when Jesus show up, it may be our first time seeing him, but it shouldn't be your first time talking to him. That's true. When he show up, you'd be like, now I'm putting the face with the name. Right? You've been talking with him. You've been abiding with him. That's what you want to have. Confidence is reserved for the believer. Shame is reserved for those who choose not to allow God's word to rule over and in their lives. Let me say this again. Confidence is reserved for the believer. Hebrews says with boldness, with confidence, now we can enter and step up to the throne of grace right? And receive help, mercy, grace in a time of need. With confidence you can do that because you know your high priest. You know what Jesus has done on your behalf. Confidence is reserved for the believer. So how should we live? So far, John has told us we should live abiding. What is that abiding? It's walking with Jesus. It's talking with Jesus, having fellowship with Jesus. That's what he's telling us. Let's jump in, verse, jump in verse 29. If you know that he, now John moves us to the Father. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. If you know that he is righteous, You know that everybody who practices righteousness has been born of here. Essentially, John is telling us that those who practice righteousness, which that's that's not what the false teachers was doing the other day. He says those who practice righteousness can be confident that they have been born of him. Now, John is not John is John is dealing with the fruit of our salvation at this point, not the root of our salvation. The fruit of our salvation, not the root of our salvation. That, 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 that because we have been born of him, something should be different about your life. There should be some characteristics about your life that reflects the father. Do you know anybody who have father features? That's what John is saying. There should be something about your life that shows your identity is tied to somebody. You come from somebody. You come from a family. 
The word there, practice, denotes an ongoing practice. It's ongoing. This is not just happening once or twice. This is something you make a practice of. The NFL teams, right, the athletes, they're getting ready. Today is the Super Bowl. We ready. We ready, baby. Right? They crunk. They in there. Why? But they've been practicing. They've been reading the playbook. They've been spending time in the planning room over and over and over and over. Execute, execute, execute. This the big game. Let's practice this. They can't just come in on Monday and be like, eh, I might hit that thing Saturday and do something. No. You have to apply this thing to your life. Every single practice. And for the believer, it's the same. You have to practice this. This is what we are called to do. This has been given to us, right? And John is saying, practice righteousness. Practice this in your life. It's ongoing. This is something we don't do flawlessly, but this is something we do faithfully, right? I'm not talking about perfection. I'm not talking about perfection. I'm saying that you practice living out. You practice stay connecting to the Holy Spirit. Why? Because that's part of your sanctification. This is, this is like, I practice doing this. I practice applying to my life. I'm not sinless, but I should sin less, right? There should be some sin, like, I ain't doing everything I used to do. Thank God. That's some fruit in my life. Maybe I can't be the only one. Now, some of us here today wouldn't be here years ago. We'll be just walking out of the club right about now or somewhere, right? I'm saying this is a practice. We don't live this life flawlessly, but we aim to live it faithfully. And when we're living it faithfully, we have to lean into the Holy Spirit. Roman tells us that by the Spirit put to death the deeds of the flesh. He didn't say by your own strength. By the Holy Spirit, Romans tells us, put to death the deeds of the flesh. So what he's saying, you got to invest in your own sanctification. Now, don't get me wrong. Sanctification belongs to God from the beginning to the end. Paul says that in Philippians, right? Paul tells us in Philippians that this, this, this good work that has began in you, God is going to bring it to what? Completion at the return of Christ. So ultimately, it belongs to God. But we all have an active part of our sanctification. Your sanctification is not just passive. Part of it is. But for the most part, all of it is belong to God. But there is a part of us we have to actively participate in this. We have a responsibility to put in us and around us what God wants for us. Let me say it again. We have a responsibility to put in us and around us, that's our environment, what God has for us. There's a responsibility in doing that. What does that look like? That's look like making sure you have brothers and sisters of the faith that's around you. At school, even for, I'm talking to the youth, at school, make sure you're hanging around folks that you know that want to see you grow. They want to see you succeed, for sure, just in an earthly sense, but in a heavenly one, too. Someone that's looking beyond this life, but life eternal. Having young folks that love Jesus around you, but for the adults as well, in the workplace. Sometimes it's hard. I get it. Circumstances is different for everybody. But there's a responsibility to make sure you are applying, practicing righteousness, and you can't do this yourself. This is collectively. The issue is that when we read scripture, we read it so isolated and think it's just me. I got to do all this by myself. No, John is writing to a community of people, future generation saints, and he's encouraging them. He's giving wisdom to him, to them, because he know you need one another to do this. So how should we live, right? We're talking about that. We have to abide. We have to apply God's word to our life. But John discloses something else in the text here. He explains that this practice, right, this practices of righteousness has a deeper work. 
within. Notice this. He says, he talks about this new birth, being born of God. You can't earn it. (laughs) You can't do it yourself. Jesus said, and it's essential and you need it. He tells Nicodemus that. You must be born again. If you're not born again, Jesus says, you can't see the kingdom of God. You can't find the doorknob of heaven on your own. It must be born again. That's what he said. So God has to do what? Spiritual heart surgery on us. That's where God is. He takes this stony heart out that unresponsive heart, the heart that don't want to listen to his word, the heart that's not on frequency with him, the heart that don't care about his glory. He removes that heart. But then he puts in this heart of flesh, Ezekiel tells us. He put in this heart of flesh that beats for him, that has the spirit of God in it, and that want to see God's glory, that listen to God's voice, that's on frequency with God. That's that new life that he put in you. So he has to do do this heart surgery. You can't do this. Have you ever seen anybody do their own heart surgery? No. Not even in the earthly sense you can't see that. They dead. And that's the point. You dead until God awakens you. Paul says this in Ephesians 2, right? He tells us that, that, that we were what? We was children of wrath dead in our trespasses and our sins. But God, rich in mercy. I think about rich in mercy. What is rich in mercy? I think about Scrooge McDuck. Most people didn't watch that because it's old school growing up. When he's just jumping in his money bin and he's just just diving through because he just had just a wealth of it. And that's rich in mercy when I think about God. I just got so much mercy, right? Rich in mercy, he made us alive together with Christ. That's what it tells us. So God moves towards us on our behalf. But the reality that if you are truly born again, if you're truly a child of God, there must be some righteousness in your life, some practicing of it. The fruit of salvation. Because God is there. We good? All right, so this is what he's saying. He's getting ready to move us in the text. We're getting ready to move from the first movement to the second movement. In chapter 2, John deals with fellowship with God. We split into chapter 2 into chapter 3. And so John is getting ready to move us from fellowship with God to the love of God. And he comes in in verse one here, he says, and, and what kind of love the Father has given to us that we shall be called children of God, and so we are, that we shall be called children of God, and so we are. He's instilling confidence in them. Know that regardless of all the false teaching that's going on, regardless of what they're saying about Jesus, regardless of all this stuff that's going on, And there's some crazy teaching that was going on. We can't identify exactly what it was. But wherever it was, it wasn't Christ-centered teaching. It wasn't what John taught them. That's why John is constantly telling them, remember the message we proclaim to you. Future generations, as parents, we say the same thing. Remember this message. Keep this in you. Because you're going to hear something else in life. And you need to be reminded of these truths. So what John does, he, he, he tells us that this great love, what kind of love? What kind of love is this? The, 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 the Greek word here, it, it, it denotes this, this unearthly type love, this unusual love, this unique love that has come from the Father, this real love. And Mary J. Blyde in 1992 put out her song, Real Love. I'm searching for a real love. Something to set my heart free. And that's the thing. It's something to set my heart free. And what I want to tell you, on Calvary, God brought forth real love. Put it on display 
that he laid his son out on the cross. He became, took the penalty for our sins. He was the payment for our sins. And he showed real love. John says earlier in the letter, he's the propitiation for our sins. Just meaning that he, he changed the attitude of God from being against us to now being for us. That's real love. Great love. John says, the Father has poured his love out on us to the point that we went from children of wrath to children of God. Children of God. Access to the kingdom. Access to the Savior. Access to Christ, the go before the throne. And as children of God, John says, we have a different relationship with the world because you have a new relationship. You have, a, have you ever had an ex before? Don't answer that. I'm just playing that. But you got an ex. The world is your ex when it comes down to the world. When it comes down to being in relationship with Jesus, the world is your ex. He says what? The reason why the world, what? The reason why the world does not know us is that it, what? Did not know who? Him, right? The reason the world don't have a, this, this, this word here that uh, no, gnosko, it's, it's, it's just a word that means deep, intimate relationship. It, 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 the, the, the world don't have this intimacy with us anymore because we no longer of the world. And because they don't know us, they don't have this relationship with us, it shows that they don't have this a past relationship with Christ either. So the reason why the world don't have a relationship with us is because they never had a relationship with Jesus. That's what it's saying. They don't have that relationship. This is what I want to challenge you. This is, this is for the youth, but this is for all of us. Because some of the seasoned saints know. Listen, you're going to be, as, as believers in Christ, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. <laughs> Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. What do I mean? You're going to look different if you follow in Christ. You're going to uh, stick out like a sore thumb, as they used to say. Right? There's, there's, there's going to be something about your life that people may make fun of you because you are following Christ. But here's the thing. Be different because God wanted you to be different. He don't want you to just fit in and do the stuff the world do. He put his spirit in you so you could be different. So you can be different in bringing people to Christ. Looking at the bigger picture of life. Right? So he put his spirit in you for that reason. Be different. And notice also that you don't get your approval from the world. Not when you've been received and redeemed by God. You don't need the approval of the world. I know it's hard. I know those followers and social media, that stuff look good, man. I get it. I get it. David in Psalm 73 said, I almost slipped when I looked over there at the wicked because they was living good. <laughs> That's what David says. They got everything out. Like, how, is they, how do they have this? It looks like they living the blessed life. And David at the end of the psalm says, oh, I know what God is doing to them. He's bringing them to ruin. He's given over to them their heart's desire. They don't want that. They don't want him. If you want this, here you go. But the end of the road for this right here is destruction. But I get it. So David agrees with you. If you feel like it's hard and it just looks like they get everything, that's a reminder that, yeah, but the end is destruction. So John tells us, and as I talk to the youth, to be confident, be confident, be confident in the teachings, the truth of the gospel that you've received. Let me, let me move on here. But what I also want, when I think about it, I just a side note on that text because it, it hit me that although the world don't know him, doesn't take away our responsibility to make sure we are 
proclaiming the good news to the world. It's true the world don't know, them, know Jesus, but it's also true in God's word that he's called us to be ambassadors, right? It says that Paul said he's making his appeal through us to the world. So we are called to proclaim that good news and see people come to faith. Let me back back for a second. So where are we at? All right, right? John is instilling confidence in us, right? And we can be confident, but why? Because we're children of God. Right. And we've been abiding in him. This is what he's re writing to his hearers there. He wants them to know, stand firm, keep doing what you're doing. Don't listen to these teachings that's, that's dragging you away from God. Confidence draw you closer to the Lord. All right. And what have we been? He, so he says, how do we do this? Well, it's about first who you are, your children of God. And as children of God, how should we live? We should abide and we should apply. Abide with Jesus, apply his word to our life. Are we good? We there? All right, so now we're moving. We've been talking about what does it look like to be a child of God? What does it look like to be a child of God? So here, here he comes. What are you doing here? It's moving us from our present state to our future state. Verse 2, listen to what he say. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. We shall be like him. What is he talking about? Let us let, let Paul, Paul, let's let him help us out here. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says this, just as we have been born, just as we have born the image of the man from, of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. In Philippians, he says, but our citizenship, citizenship is where? In heaven. And from it, we wait a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like, to be like his glorious body. So there's a transformation that's going to happen in place, right? Like this body that we have is going to peel off, right? And if that's too hard for you to understand, just you ain't going to look nothing like you looked at, look like right now. I say that. You're going to look different, right? It's so mysterious, even as, as, the, as Paul writes and uses this language. But what he's saying is that the veil is coming off when Christ comes back. There is no more, I wonder. Everything is clear. I guess we got 5K, 4K now. It's going to be clearer than that, right? This is... There's no more veil when he comes back. But it's more than that. It's just not the removing of body. You're talking about the union, the total union between Christ and his people. That sin is not an issue anymore whatsoever. Communion with Jesus is forever. The hope that we've been waiting on is here. And sometimes you just have to sit and just read up on what is that like being with Christ? I want to I don't even have time to go through that. I literally got four minutes to finish, y'all. So you know the clock I'm looking at. Um, but what I'm saying, that, that might not get you excited. You know, the reason I'm saying that, and be honest, because it never really got me excited because I live too much in the here and now and didn't think enough about the future. Now, I got stories why I didn't think about the future, but I trust me, I do not have time to go there. But what I'm saying is that we are given the scripture because God has given us this we don't like people to spill the, like, don't, don't, don't spill the beans. I haven't saw the movie yet. God don't care. I'm giving you what's going to happen in the end. And I'm giving you everything that's going to happen in between. And so to encourage you and, and give you confidence to move through this life, you need to open up the scriptures and read. And don't just get caught up in the fact that you're in a pandemic because this pandemic is here. Eternity is forever. All right? Now I'm done screaming at y'all. I wasn't trying to do that. So, and plus I'm off script. But I honestly just had to just tell you some of the issues that if that don't get you excited to the fact that Jesus is coming back, you really have to understand what that really means when he comes back. All right? Let's move. All I'm saying is this. this. Let's move into verse 3. I'm going to get out of here. I'm not going to keep you. In verse 3, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Listen, he's saying, live in light of Christ's return. 
And if what we've already seen, if we're going to look like him in the future, now he's not talking about you're going to be like Christ. You're not going to be deity, but you're going to be glorified enough, <laughs> right? You, as much as humans can be, you're going to be glorified enough. You won't be God. But, but, but if we're going to be like Christ, if we're going to resemble him in the future, what he's saying in the text right now, he's bringing it full circuit, circle. Why don't you look like him right now? You get what he's saying? If you're going to be like him anyway, when he appear, look like him now. There should be a deep desire in you right now to abide with him, to spend time with him, to apply his word to your life so you can look like him now. Like I said, when he come back, you, want, you don't want to be like, oh, yeah, I put a face with the name because you've been talking with him already. So that's what he wants us to see. John wants his hearers to be confident. Be confident. And by being confident, he says, you're a child of God. Not only are you a child of God, you have fellowship with God. So we have to look at that. We can be confident. Let's be confident. You can be confident that he paid your sin debt in full. You can be confident that because he rose from the grave, you also were raised from the grave. You can be confident of his atonement. You can be confident that he's sitting at the right hand of the Father praying on your behalf. You can be confident in that. And this, I'll leave you with this. This is the challenge I'll leave with you this morning. The challenge is this. Everybody here, from adult to youth, be intentional in your life First, know, have an understanding of who you are. You're children of God. What great love, what kind of love, what out of world type of love have brought you in this place? Jesus was that love, right, of the Father displayed. So he says this, and this is my challenge to you, abide and apply. Abide with Jesus. Find out what abiding with Jesus looks like in your life right now. Evaluate that now. If you're not abiding with them, get with some brothers and sisters. We got all types of community groups available. We talk to Pastor E, we'll get you in there. We got all types of resources available. Talk to Caitlin Jones, she got a lot of resources for you. But we want you abiding in him. What does that abiding in him? Fellowship. What does fellowship mean? Walking with him, talking with him. The hymn in the garden, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. The voice I hear falling on my ear, the son of God disclosing, right? It's being in communion with him. I want you to do that. Let me pray for us now. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your spirit, Lord, that moves in us, awakens us to your promises, awakens us to your glory, awakens us to do the work that you called us to do. We're grateful, Father. We thank you. We love you. We ask this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand, church, as we respond as children to our Father. I'm in worship and song.
test Yet I've been a criminal I've stolen your breath And sang my own song Lord, I confess That I'm far from innocent Shackles I wear I've bought on my own Scarlet sins had a crimson cough You nailed my dead to that over the cross An empty slate at the empty grave Thank God that stone was rolled away Lord, I confess That I've been the prodigal Made for your house Walk my own Then Jesus came and tore down my prison walls. Then came the light when He called me Friday. Scarlet sins and a crimson cord. This is our homecoming. Roses in bloom, pushed up from the embers. Rivers of tears flow from good times remembered. Families are singing and dancing and laughing. The Father is welcome. This is our
man, can you give our future generations a hand? Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Uh, we're going to close with our benediction. And just to be clear, the confidence that Pastor Des spoke about doesn't end when you walk out those doors. The blood of Christ still covers you. You still belong to him and to his people. So the benediction is putting that blessing on us as we are no longer the church gathered today, but the church scattered for the rest of the week. So let's go out under God's blessing. Would you please receive the benediction? Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will. And all of God's people said, amen indeed. Thank you for coming today. Please swing by the welcome desk if you're new or if you'd like to sign up for Pacham. If you know, want to know a little bit more about what it means to follow Jesus, I'll be out there. Other pastors will be out there and staff. We would love to talk to you. Have a great Sunday. God bless.